Welcome to the Jersey Shore. This week we're going to be photographing a variety of waterfowl and we're going to start off here at the Barnegat Jetty. I'm your host Doug Gardner and your wild photo adventure starts now. Behind me is Barnegat Lighthouse, one of New Jersey's most well-known landmarks. It sits on the northern tip of Long Beach Island on the southern side of the Barnegat Inlet. Now, the early Dutch explorers named this area Barnegat Inlet or Breakers Inlet because it's known for its massive cresting waves which made navigation so difficult. Barnegat Lighthouse, it was built in 1859 and has now been decommissioned. This is a wonderful place, not only for nice scenic shots, but we're gonna to try to get some exotic sea ducks as well along the Barnegat Jetty. So bundle up and join me. The jetty itself is a mile and a third long. It's a pretty good stretch. And trying to navigate and step over each individual rock and avoid those uh, big cracks between the rocks. I find it a lot easier to get on the beach side and just walk the beach all the way down to the end of the jetty and then find a place to cross over onto the jetty. The name of the game here is staying low and moving slow. Doesn't matter if you're dealing with the shorebirds or you're dealing with the waterfowl. It's especially important when you get up on top of those jetty rocks because you're going to stick out in the open, this bird's going to see every movement you make. See, low and slow. Got beautiful light now. Uh, it's early morning, about an hour after sunrise, so it's a low angle of sun. Uh, one thing to be careful of, the wind is blowing to my back right now, and so the birds are wanting to walk and stand into the wind. And by doing that, the, the end of their body is throwing a shadow down the side of their head. So you have to kind of wait until they turn into the light a little bit so you can get that catch light. The catch light not only brings life back into the picture, but it also gives you a, a nice, precise point to focus on. Even though these guys are mostly neutral tone, they've got a white rump and a white belly. So you've got to make sure you don't blow out the exposure on that white belly. But what I'm doing in this situation because they are mostly neutral gray. I'm just spot metering the gray rock. The wet sand would work just as well, and I'd get base, getting a base exposure there. And then because that white belly is going to blow out a little bit and be too bright, I'm stopping down about one-third to two-thirds of a stop. I'm kind of bracketing a little bit between one-third and two-thirds under that exposure. So right now I've got an exposure of one two-fiftieth of a second with an aperture of 5.6 and my ISO is 200 and that seems to be just right. The reason why these birds are grouped up like this on, on the southern side of this jetty, even though it's a westerly wind, it's kind of a north-northwest, so the wind is actually coming right down over the back side of these jetty rocks and so this is kind of the leeward side here. They're tucked in here together on the sunny side and, uh, and they, they don't have as much wind affecting. It's still quite windy but uh, uh, this is a nice little protected side of the jetty for them. Alright we're getting to the end of the jetty now and I'm gonna just park this cart right here. It's a good idea to bring a cart with you when you come out here especially if you're gonna come and spend the day. You got plenty of room to carry your lunch and all your gear. Just ease up here on top of these rocks and see what we got. The more you can blend into the rocks and just look like another rock, and the lower you can stay, the, the better success you're going to have. The name of the game is trying to get as close as you can here. 
and we're dealing with small birds. So you're gonna have to have some power. You're gonna have to have anything from a, a 300 millimeter lens to a 800 millimeter lens uh, in order to get these birds um, you know, to take up enough of a frame that you can get any considerable detail. It's a beautiful location. But if you're gonna be out here for any considerable time working, uh, it's a good idea to bring some knee pads. These rocks are pretty rough on knees, especially old knees. We got a few uh, long tails flying in. Shutter speeds when you're dealing with waterfowl, especially flying ducks, need to be very high. You want to stop that action of those wings. Uh, so I, I like to use anything above one thousandth of a second. The long tails in flight, that is really fun. But I tell you what, it can be very difficult too. Because the long tails are flying in off the ocean and they're landing right out there in that turbulent water, which is way too far to get a, a good full frame shot. We need them, you know, 30 yards from us at the max. So what I'm doing is sitting still and I'm, I've just kind of hunkered down here low between these rocks and I'm letting them come in and land out there. And periodically, one or two of them are starting to drift over here toward the rocks. So it's just a waiting game at this point. All we can do is, is wait and hope that they maybe come in a little bit closer. These are diving ducks, like I said before. They, so they dive for their food. So whichever way the current's moving or the wind's blowing, uh, will determine which way they actually point. Usually they'll point into the current or into the wind. So when they're sitting on the water, once they dive down, whatever direction they were pointing when they dove, they're gonna pop back up in that direction, usually 25 to 30 feet away. Uh, so if you see them go down, you wanna catch them as soon as they pop up, swing your camera over about 20 or 30 feet, and you'll be in pretty close proximity to where they're gonna pop back up. So when you're getting exposure for the long tail duck, you've got to change that exposure the way you, the way you go about compensating because the duck is predominantly white. There's a lot of white on there that'll blow out real easily, especially in bright sun. Remember, your camera's meter wants to make everything neutral gray. Well, that duck's not neutral gray, he's white. So you've got to bring it back to white by adding light. Meter the white duck and then open up um, a stop to a stop in the third. as I can and get as close to the animal's eye level as I can. This is a situation I just do not recommend doing it. Uh, I heard reports just before I came out here that uh, a couple of years, years ago, uh, a gentleman fell on one of these rocks and got his head stuck between one of these boulders. If nobody was out here to help you, the tide could rise 
and uh, you're going to drown. So uh, this is not a place to, to take lightly. You've got to be very, very careful out here. Now there are some places along this jetty that you can get yourself lower. And as I saw earlier today, when the long tails were coming in and landing out here in front, as soon as I got down low profile, they really started to swim me a lot closer and gave us a lot better opportunities. I don't recommend you trying to get down low next to the water there to get that eye level position, but there are some places in between some of these rocks that you can get safely and kind of lower yourself with no problem. Very cold, but that's the reason they call it waterfowl, I guess, because you got to get wet and it's always in foul weather. Now, if I sat here and told you with waterfowl photography that every shot that you see of mine, I composed it and shot it exactly like that, I would be lying to you. If anybody tells you that, they're lying to you because with waterfowl photography, you've got exposure, you've got focus, and just getting the bird in the frame, these birds fly very fast. I like to shoot really loose. I put the subject in the center and I fire away, and then I will actually crop that, that picture to get the composition that I want. Wow, what a spectacular opportunity. We're here at the Edwin Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, and I got a tip while we were up on Barnegat Jetty that there was a snowy owl um, that had been seen for a couple of days. So we rode down here not far, about 30 miles south, and um, lo and behold, we're sitting right here on the edge of the road. Beautiful subject. Um, snowy owls are, are really unique because they have the white plumage with the dark banding on the sides of the wings. This guy seems to be real content just sitting right here. Now, we've got horrible weather today. I mean, it's heavy overcast. They're saying it could snow, could rain. We don't know, but uh, either way you put it, the light is yucky. Um, but we're gonna try to do what we can with this subject since it is a unique uh, uh, sighting. You don't normally find snowy owls this far uh, south and east, but we're in the middle of what they call an eruption, which happens every few years. You'll get an influx of, of snowy owls that, that migrate down a little bit further than they normally would. Because it is an overcast day, it's a very blue uh, tone to, the, to all the light out here, so I need to adjust my white balance and warm it up just a little bit. So I, I, I choose to use the manual Kelvin scale and adjust my white balance manually. Um, so. Normally, daylight setting is 5400 to 5600 Kelvin. Uh, in situations like this, I want to warm it up a little bit, so I'm shooting at 6200 Kelvin. It's heavy gray overcast skies, and we have a mostly white subject here. So what I'm doing is I'm spot metering the head of the owl, and I'm going to open up two-thirds of the stop to kind of add a little bit of light and bring the white back to white. Otherwise, if I had just metered the owl, and trust what my meter says, the camera's gonna try to make the owl gray, and he's not gray, he's white, or mostly white, so we have to add light to bring it back to white. So right now I'm shooting at a shutter speed of 1 640th of a second, and 1,000 ISO, and my f-stop is f8. Oh, what a pretty, pretty bird, pretty bird. Beautiful. Well, this is really special, but you know, it is marginal light, I've done about what I can do with it. Um, now, if it does start snowing, I'm gonna come back here and try to shoot this again. Snow could change this into a very dramatic shot. I'd never been to this place before and wow, what a spectacular treat. 
Uh, we've got all kinds of waterfowl, everything from swans, Atlantic brant, snow geese, Canada geese, a whole variety of other waterfowl and ducks. So uh, let's we'll see what we can get here. This is a perfect example of how aperture affects your image and how it can help you clean up your image and make the subject pop out of the frame. As you see right here, this old, dead, tangled tree, there's just a lot of distracting dead limbs around it. So what do you do? If you were to use a large aperture, which is a small number, like 5.6 or f4, what that'll do is that will blur everything in the background and everything in the foreground, which helps kind of smooth out those distracting sticks and, and twigs. If you were to use a small aperture, which is a large number, like f16, f11, something like that, then everything is gonna be in sharp focus and your subject doesn't tend to pop out of the frame as, as, as well. So here are two photographs. One was taken at 5.6 and the other one was taken at f16. And as you can tell, the one taken at 5.6 has a lot less distractions in the background. Another great opportunity. Let's see what else we can find. All right, that is a lot of snow geese. I don't know, five, six, seven thousand of them in that flock. Really a spectacular scene. All right, so my exposure right now is one twenty-five hundredth of a second at f8, and I'm using an ISO of 400. Now, why do I need to use a f-stop or f8? Well, I have thousands of birds in my scene here, and you got to figure that that flock of birds there's a lot of depth of field between the birds on, that, on the front of the flock and the ones in the background. And I want as many of those birds in sharp focus as possible. Um, because we're not close enough to pick out one or two or even a small group of three or four birds, I'm having to shoot the whole flock and kind of encompass some of the environment in which they live, the marsh and the water below them. So I want as much in sharp focus as I possibly can get. So I'm using uh, f-stop of f8, which is gonna give me more depth of field. snow geese they're all white except for the little black wingtips so how do you get exposure for that it can be a little tricky in full sun and the brighter the sun the the more light that's going to be reflected off of that white bird for me the easiest thing I found to do is I look at the scene say what does this scene look like in black and white and I quickly try to find something that is neutral tone and value a royal blue sky is going to be almost exactly neutral gray so you can meter that and get a perfect meter reading um, for the amount of light that's actually falling on, on your subject. Also, blue water, that's another value that is almost neutral gray in, in tone. And then I am stopping down, I'm taking away light by one and a half stops to two stops depending on how bright the sun is. And that'll give you a perfect white exposure. The key to being successful in wildlife photography is patience. Sit back, relax, and wait the animal out. Let the animal behave naturally and you'll get much better shots. I've seen folks, especially with snow geese, they want to get the big blast off shot. We have thousands of snow geese in the air taking off at one time. And it is a, it's an amazing sight to see and, and it makes for some amazing photographs. However, I see people sometimes that they'll go out and they intentionally flush the birds so they can get that shot. Well, if you do that, the birds are going to flush. Yes, you may or may not get the shot, and then the birds are gone. The thing about snow geese, if you let them act naturally, what they normally do is they come into an area where they want to feed. And as they sit there and feed, they'll feed for an hour or so, and then the birds in the back of the flock will jump up in a big blast off and fly over the birds that are still sitting on the water and land again and then the birds that are in the tail end of the flock, they will jump up and kind of creates a hopscotch effect. So you get five or six or seven big blast off shots. Snow geese are especially fun because they're a real challenge. Not so much a challenge from a exposure or a photography standpoint, but because they're generally very hard to get close to. So there's places like this that are really special. These are managed waterfowl impoundments, and um, as you can tell, they really, really like uh, being here. The high winds today are, are actually helping us a little bit because it keeps the birds up and moving. Also, it's very cold, 
and uh, the colder it is, the more the birds have to feed. Once the temperatures get above 42 degrees, actually the birds don't have to feed at all. Now because I'm shooting so much white, I got to pay attention to my exposure. Those whites can blow out real easy in this full sun. But this is nice because we have kind of some dark storm clouds in the distance and full sun, which is front lighting them. That wind's kind of brutal, guys. Kind of brutal. All right, let's change positions. I tell you, this place has turned out to be a great spot for flight shots. We've got Canada geese coming in now. Nice, right over the marsh grass. I tell you, there's been quite a few Atlantic brants seen in here as well. I haven't seen uh, any opportunities to get tight shots of them yet, but, but I've seen some nice flock shots out over the marsh. But it's all about putting your time in. Hopefully we'll get some of those opportunities later today. You know, there's an interesting story behind the Atlantic brant. This refuge was actually developed specifically for the Atlantic brant. Back in the 1930s, a mold attacked the uh, aquatic vegetation, the eelgrass in specifically, which is uh, the Atlantic Brant staple food, and it killed all the eelgrass out in the bays. And so this is one of the last few strongholds that the Atlantic Brant had to rely on. So this was specifically set aside to, uh, to help provide habitat for the Atlantic Brant. And now one third of the entire population of Atlantic Brant winters right here in the uh, Edwin Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. One thing that people overlook when they're out doing bird photography is wind direction. It's equally as important as lighting direction. Um, in this scenario, we've got the wind coming across in front of us here from left to right and the sun is coming in over my shoulder here. So what that means is all ducks, geese, and swans, they're gonna take off and land into the wind. We have a lot of birds sitting out on the outside of this impoundment over here to the right, and so they're periodically getting up into the wind and flying straight across in front of us and landing back over here in this impoundment on the, on the left side of me here. Now ideally, you would want the sun and the wind coming from the same direction, because what would happen is the birds would get up in front of us and fly straight toward us, and those can be some of the most dramatic shots. But let's keep on it, never know what the rest of the day has to offer. Coming up right across here, just constant stream of Canada geese, and they are really making for some great opportunities for flight shots here. They're flying into the wind, so they, they're real slow. It's a lot easier to get your autofocus sensor on them when they're flying slow. Canada geese are so just slightly darker than neutral gray, but you can pretty much trust what your meter has to say. So I'm metering a neutral tone area in the background, and then I come back up on these guys. So I'm shooting one sixteen hundredth of a second at f8 and 320 ISO. So if you're an aperture priority shooter, this would be a perfect scenario for that, and shutter priority would work really well. Among the species you're going to see here are Atlantic Brant snow geese, swans, Canada geese, and then a whole variety of waterfowl. We've got mallards, black ducks, pintails, gadwall, widgeon, northern shovelers, ruddy ducks. We've got 49,000 acres here. It's all managed wetlands. This is the place to come to. All right, that Drake's getting ready to do wing flap. Well, it's been another spectacular trip along the Jersey shoreline. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us this week. I hope you've enjoyed this week's show and learned a little more about waterfowl photography. More information about this week's show is available online. And remember, it's not just about a photograph, it's the outdoor experience. I'm your host, Doug Gardner. Thank you for joining me on another wild photo adventure. And the early Dutch explorers, they named this area Barnegat, which means breakers, breakers inlet. Most waterfowl don't, most waterfowl, blah, mouth's freezing up. Blah, blah, blah. I can't feel my face.
Photographing a variety of waterfowl. A mouse frozen. I feel like I'm back in Normandy. In a bunker. Shutter priority were, were, were my mouth frozen. Now today we've skipped a perfect example of her a perfect a perfect example to share with you a perfect example of another car coming by to interrupt my setup. <laughs> 